delighted that, that you're joining us tonight. This is a program sponsored uh, by three organizations, as I'm sure you know, the Center for Research on Vermont here at the University, Special Collections, uh, both of, of whose directors are here, Jeff and Richard, and by the Vermont Historical Society, whose interim director is here as well. <laughs> well, yes, I, I'm back. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, uh, uh, we've got a, a topic of tremendous interest, and uh, I, I know that uh, there's been a lot of uh, um, this in the news lately, and um, a lot of uh, interest in policy questions, and that certainly sparks a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in coming tonight and, uh, and uh, a lot of news coverage uh, lately as well. So we look forward to, uh, to Gary's presentation in, in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm told that uh, in my job description is uh, the requirement that I offer a brief commercial for VHS wherever I go, uh, and uh, I'm delighted to do that. We have membership brochures in the back. We also uh, have uh, copies of Vermont History, our journal, uh, which includes uh, Gary Shattuck's article uh, for sale in the back. Um, and the VHS, as you know, uh, with uh, facilities in Barrie and Montpelier, is the only organization that collects everything about Vermont. Um, and uh, we've got a, a talented staff uh, in our two museums and, and research library. We do a lot of educational programs all across the state and bring a lot of kids to Montpelier to, uh, uh, to show them uh, their state's history there. And we're working on a, a particularly interesting project now, I think, called the 70s. Yes, the 1970s. Uh, you know, what happened in the 70s stays in the 70s. I'm not going to ask you <laughs> any questions tonight. Um, but uh, we're going to uh, do what we can over the coming year to present uh, a lot of uh, activities and displays about that era in our uh, nation and state's history. And uh, uh, our staff are out uh, researching and interviewing. And I think it's going to be really uh, fun over the next uh, year to, to look back at that uh, period in our history. I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, Mark Hudson, the former director of VHS, for getting this program uh, started, and uh, Amanda Gustin uh, from our team, who's uh, carried on after Mark bugged out and, uh, <laughs> and making all the arrangements for, uh, for our program tonight. It's a pleasure to introduce a longtime friend and colleague, uh, Nick Muller, who many of you know. Uh, Nick uh, has a great uh, career in academia, um, a dozen years of which were right here on this campus. Um, I got to know Nick in the aforementioned 70s when we served together on the uh, State Bicentennial Commission. Uh, not the State Hood Bicentennial Commission, but the 1976 version. And uh, uh, he's been a great uh, friend ever since. Um, after his time at UVM, though, Nick, well, kind of wandered away. Uh, out in the wilderness somewhere and a few other places and we've almost got him back. Uh, he lives just across the lake. Yes, he's a Yorker now. Um, but he can see Vermont from where he lives and, and uh, we're glad that he's uh, uh, agreed to come over this evening uh, to participate in this exciting program. Welcome, Nick Muller. nice to be here at this event. I can't hear me, but can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I'd like to talk a few minutes about Samuel B. Hand. Uh, many people in this room knew him, knew him well. Many people in this room collaborated with him uh, on his historical efforts. He came to the University of Vermont after a brief stint at that famous school in Pennsylvania, Slippery Rock. And he was happy to be in Burlington, he and Harriet. His first piece of work, that in, published work, that involved the state of Vermont was an article he did with Lyman J. Gould, uh, a really good friend of Sam's. And they explored the mountain rule in Vermont politics. And they read a paper at the Vermont Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, who published that piece. Over he came here, though, as a New Deal historian and a biographer of Samuel Rosenman, who worked with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was interested in the judiciary. He was interested in law. He was interested in government. And he looked at it through a historical lens. Since uh, the governor and the interim executive director of the Vermont Historical Society 
as let it escape that I escaped. <laughs> when I left the University of Vermont, after teaching Vermont history for a dozen years, Sam Hand moved into that and became the University of Vermont's leading scholar of Vermont's past. He and I published a book together in 1981. He published a biography of Samuel Rosamann. He published The Star That Set, The History of the Republican Party. And he was one of the people that fomented uh, the biography of Philip Hoff, which came out a year and a half ago. He also published articles like Nicholas Copernicus and the Inception of Bread Buttering, <laughs> published by the Journal of the American Medical Association. And I'm not sure whether they knew it was tongue in cheek or not. <laughs> Anyone who knew Sam understood that he had a marvelous sense of humor. It was never purient. It always saw something, a flaw, a, a strength in human nature and talked about it. And uh, he also was very insightful. Although as Travis Jacobs and I were recalling, to understand his insights, you had to be prepared for the strange course of logic by which he arrived at them. <laughs> After his passing, a group of his colleagues, several of us are here, decided that we would try to raise sufficient funds to dedicate a space in the renovated, if it ever happens, uh, library in the original Billings Library. And we worked uh, to do this. We worked with Sam's daughter, who's here, Sally Hand, in the front row, she wave your hands. And uh, with a generous uh, matching gift, we raised almost $100,000. And that room will happen. Following that, there was a decision that we should see if we can't get the <coughs> Historical Society, Special Collections, and the Center for Research on Vermont to begin a series of lectures dedicated to the memory and honor of Sam Han. And so tonight is the first of these. Now, if the interim director of the State Historical Society can uh, plug the society, I would like to say as one of the founders of the Center for Research on Vermont that it also deserves your respect uh, and your affection and occasionally your money. <laughs> uh, the university supported it generously at the beginning. Uh, it has withdrawn almost all of that support and it's maybe time to get some of that back uh, as well. Sitting to my right is Gary Shattuck, who's tonight's speaker. Uh, Gary has become a friend. His career, uh, and I hope none of you met him, uh, was a 17-year state trooper and a commander. And while he was doing that, he earned a law degree at Vermont Law School. And he came out and was an assistant attorney general and he was the prosecutor for the Organized Drug Crime Task Force. Thank you. <laughs> He's wired up, so he can't really say too much. So he then went on to, uh, and during that year, he, years, he worked closely with Art Cohn of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, and also with Giovanna Peoples, the state uh, archeologist. And they were responsible for the legislation that protected the artifacts, the historic sites, became sufficiently well known that the National Park Service toured him around various places so they could explain to other states how to do that. He retired and started the research. He discovered that an ancient Shattuck was a leader in Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts. And that got him deeper in. He started to work, he's one of the two people I really know who have worked very seriously in the early state court records. And he produced a book that started on the Black Snake Affair and expanded to corruption and murder in the state. 
that book is available. He talked with me about his next book. I wanted to get him into the 20th century, and he told me he didn't like to research or write about anybody that was living because he didn't want to have to put up with what they might say. <laughs> and he was interested in temperance. And he began to study Vermont temperance movement in the 19th century and got into the records, as you'll see, and you don't want to hear much more from me. And in doing that, he discovered the use of opium in the state. Widespread. And so tonight's talk on the use of opium in Vermont, the present priest, priest learns from the past, uh, is based on that research. It's very fresh and very new, and I'm happy to present to you my friend and a great scholar, Gary Shattuck. Thank you. Uh, when I uh, broached uh, Nick and um, John Duffy uh, about a year ago, uh, we met in a restaurant in uh, Virginia, and I told him about what I was finding out about opium. And when these two gentlemen expressed some surprise, I knew that it was uh, a matter of clearing the decks and addressing it, because when these two men have not heard about it, I know, knew that we were into, onto something. Thank you uh, to the center. Uh, thank you to VHS and to Bailey House Co Special Collections very much for putting this on, and I deeply uh, uh, appreciate and am honored uh, to be the, uh, the inaugural lecture on behalf on, on the Sam Hand Lecture Series. This uh, is the Steamer Champlain. If you think you had a bad day, think about what happened July 16, 1875. 80 passengers on board when 58-year-old pilot John Eld Eldridge managed to drive it up onto the rocks while under the influence of morphine which he was taking at that time in order to treat gout. Uh, there should have been a banner across the top, but we've got a technological issue going on here. But anyway, uh, it managed to uh, trash that boat, and uh, it had to salvage pieces of it, and that was the end of the Champlain. Drugs in the uh, 19th century have just not been talked about. Uh, anyone familiar with passing familiarity with Vermont history knows about the temperance movement, prohibition, but they haven't talked about that other prong, the drug prong, or the third prong, because it was a trilogy of uh, substances being abused. There were the drunkards, there were the opium eaters, and there were the tobacco chewers. So all three of those you see in the literature throughout the 19th century, but only uh, alcohol being, being addressed. We know early on that, and we'll, get, we'll uh, give a passing reference to alcohol just so we can put this into context as to how the opium issue came about. We know early on in May uh, 1775 when Ethan Allen and the boys went through the front doors of Fort Ticonderoga. They immediately liberated 90 gallons of rum from the uh, British commander there, and then went on their Bacchanal, uh, much to uh, their discredit. But that, that's the opening stages of uh, Vermont's uh, use of rum, if you will. In 1778, uh, we started to see more rum coming in. Uh, distilled spirits, they don't say what it is, but the Council of Safety uh, said, in uh, you read it in Slade's, uh, state papers, certain spiritous liquors whereby drunkenness, idleness, quarrels, etc., etc., is promoted among us, is starting to come in from outside the state. This is an important moment, near as I can tell, because this is the first bit of legislation which goes, the issue goes on throughout the 19th century, through the 20th century, and is with us today. To what extent is the legislature going to be involved in the management of things like alcohol and drugs? and things like that. But we got an early start on that back in 1778. When the council decided what they were going to do was to, in order to deal with this outside influence coming in, to license taverns and uh, allow the selectmen and the individual towns to decide who's an appropriate person to run a tavern that could be, uh, be relied upon to deal with that. So that's the beginning of the question of how much government involvement. We also know that the legislators themselves were heavy drinkers. Here's the 1787 wine account for the Vermont General Assembly, compliments of Paul and Company at VHS. Um, and this is just a representative couple of pages, and they were just, in some of the accounts, roaring drunk in Windsor. Um, you know, they perambulated, or perambulated around the state when they had their um, sessions. 
Uh, they're drinking Flip, Sling, Toddy, Punch, Cider, Bitters, Gin, Rum, Brandy. Uh, it goes on and on after page after page. And if you want to read what uh, Chittenden's drinking, you can get the book and open it up. Anyway, we know the legislature is doing that. By 1800, uh, the, um, the war has stopped, obviously. Uh, people are coming in and settling. We have a great uh, influx of uh, farmers growing uh, their crops, and a lot of wheat is being produced. It's difficult to ship out to Boston, uh, to Troy, uh, to Albany, because it's, it's pricey to, uh, to put it on wagons and send it. So what's the next thing that they do? We have a response in the technological sense that they start picking up the issue of uh, distilling in the upper left-hand corner, obviously. That's a distilling kit that you could pick up at a local general store. There was a lot of patents for, distill, uh, for stills going on, and a lot of Vermonters did this in their farms. And what this does is it creates ardent spirits. It's not fermented like beer or wine. It's, it's uh, distilled, and it goes through the process and becomes very strong. And each time you distill the product, it gets worse. So that when you see these jugs with, jugs with XXX on them, that's been distilled through in three processes, or double X two times. So we see this happening, and the response is going to be to technology. In 1853, uh, a Scotsman makes the, uh, the first hypodermic, and then we're going to deal with that, obviously. So we've got too much grain. We've got uh, too many distilleries uh, showing up in the state. By 1810, 125 of them churning out all kinds of gin and whiskey. Uh, by my count, as far as the licensed inns and taverns go at the uh, State Archives in 1801, there were 489 licensed inns and taverns in Vermont. Between 1801 and 1802 in Rutland, that number goes from 46 to 122 taverns in one single year. There is a great deal of alcohol being consumed. In 1802, these, this is just representative. Uh, these are 98 licensed taverns in Windsor, all listed right there. So, I mean, we have a lot of taverns. We've got a lot of ardent spirits. People are drinking this. They're getting drunk readily. They're going to the taverns. They're falling down drunk in the street. It's rendering uh, the families uh, destitute because they're paying for this. People are not tending to their farms. And we see this go on through uh, the teens and into the 20s, 1828. Finally, the temperance movement is going to uh, get involved. And the interesting thing about the temperance movement is only addressing ardent spirits. It's not all alcohol. It's only looking at the distilled things. And it's only as the movement goes along that they pull in the fermented beers and wines. Uh, and so that, I think, is a distinction um, to be made when we get to opium. Is it artificially dealt with, like through distillation, or is it naturally fermented, like beer and wine? Because the temperance people initially ignored beer and wine. And the question goes on up until 1852 when we have prohibition, how much is the government going to be involved in regulating this? They put licensing in the county court, they take it out of the court, they give it to the towns, they take it out of the town, they put it in the legislature, and the legislature finally says, what we're going to do is prohibit the sale, manufacture and sale of alcohol in Vermont. This goes on for 50 years. However, and we're not here to talk about prohibition, but it becomes not too difficult to get alcohol throughout that 50 years. Prohibition is more or less a paper tiger. If you look forward to 1894 and you pull out a statute book and all of Vermont laws are in a single statute in 1894, prohibition consumes 23 pages, 111 separate sections of law. And if you flip into the section that deals with drugs, it's less than a page and it only deals with three ish issues. The adulteration, they prohibit the adulteration of drugs. You can't anesthetize somebody in order to commit a crime upon them. And then they deal with poisons. So there's sporadic enforcement uh, going on with regard to prohibition throughout the state, done by the state's attorneys. We don't have a, an attorney general until 1904. So Montpelier passes the laws. The counties are responsible for enforcing them. And it's not uniform, because one uh, state's attorney would not be as active as others. And we don't see anything done with drugs until 1915. Bottom line, the message is no restriction on the accessibility and use of drugs in the 19th century. So let's talk about opium. It's a natural product. It's not artificially altered, unlike distillation. It's not as disruptive. 
It's used silently. It wasn't consumed in taverns. People didn't fall down from opiate uh, use of opium uh, out in the streets. It didn't really get people's attention at the beginning until after this hypodermic and then the uh, Civil War with the return of soldiers with what was called the soldier's disease, their exposure to opium on the battlefield. Turkey at that time was coming from, I'm sorry, <laughs> opium at that time was coming from Turkey. Um, from Smyrna and Constantinople, and it went by those names. Also from East India. We also know that people in Vermont were growing opium in their gardens. Not tremendous amounts, but enough so that they could uh, treat their family on their own. Opium is a great drug, a wonderful drug. It quiets patients rapidly and was used uh, to treat people that uh, were suffering under the uh, uh, fevers. There were a number of fevers that happened throughout Vermont, and people were in distress, and so you give them opium. Morphine, incidentally, is, a, is, a, is roughly 9% of opium. So you extra, <clears throat> excuse me, extract the uh, morphine, and uh, you can uh, render that to the patient. It's also used to treat, interestingly enough, DTs, the delirium tremens from too much alcohol, so they give them opium to quiet them down. Keep in mind, when they're doing this, they're also killing people off and on also. They also use it for the insane, people that are deranged and can't control themselves. They'll feed them opium. In fact, the, in fact, the Brattleboro Retreat initially got its funding because of a bad incident in 1815 when they took a 39-year-old attorney, Richard Whitney, believed to be deranged, tried to drown him in a controlled fashion, and he kept coming to life after they pulled him out of the water, yelling, you can't kill love. <laughs> so they decided the next step was to give him opium, and they killed him. And then one of the doctor's wives was so distressed by it, uh, she uh, ended up funding um, money that went to the establishment of the Brattleboro Retreat. Okay. Uh, Opium was also used, not just by the doctors, but it's also used in a, a sociable, a social manner. And we get this clue in 1815, if you attended uh, the, the Vermont Medical Society annual meeting, Dr. Sella Gridley says up at the top, does anyone ask, what constitutes the pleasure of existence? I answer, it consists of a pleasant and easy action of the stomach and other organs immediately associated. Does anyone doubt the position? I reply, when the stomach is duly excited by food, wine, opium, tea, the highest great uh, degree of uh, corporal, moral, and mental happiness is, enjo is enjoyed. And he talks about how it's used in a social manner. So we get a clue here by an important doctor, one of the founders of Castleton Medical School, that opium's also being used uh, in, in this rather benign way. I, again, we don't have people falling down um, out in public from the use of it. The earliest I could find was a 1785 uh, reference, uh, Aaron Hastings in Bennington, who puts an ad in the paper, local paper, for the sale of drugs and medicines. And right here, opium. He's selling opium, but he's also selling patent medicines. These are medicines that originally came from England with the uh, royal patent. And these medicines include things like Bateman Drops, Qu uh, Godfrey Cordial. These are things with, marijuana, uh, with uh, opium uh, and morphine in them. And he also talks, uh, well, I don't believe he's got it on there, but uh, paragoric laudanum, everybody's heard of laudanum, wine and opium. That was very uh, consumed a lot, the black drop. They also called uh, some of the opium. Importation numbers. In 1840, uh, roughly 24,000 pounds of opium arrived on the docks. I don't know if it was New York or Boston, but it surprised the customs people there. They got their attention when that opium and that large quantity arrived. And so then they started assessing duties from that point on, and numbers were gathered. So that by 1898, we have somewhere around 565,000 pounds a year arriving into the U.S. <clears throat> Uh, drug usage at that time in the 1840s is roughly 12 grains or two, roughly two aspirin. And it rises to the time of the national crisis, our opium crisis in the mid-1890s, and this is a national issue, not just Vermont, to on an average of 52 grains, which is roughly 10 aspirin in a year's time. You'll see that in Vermont it's substantially more than that. Addiction rates in 1842 uh, by scholars and mathematicians that look at it, they figure 
uh, roughly 0.72 per thousand. In the case of Vermont, that would be roughly 200 attics in 1842. By the 1890s, they said it was 4.59 per thousand, which would equal roughly 1,500 attics uh, at the turn of the century in Vermont. But as we'll talk about this further, uh, we have much higher numbers. Also keep in mind, it's estimated at the time the doctors were getting addicted themselves. So roughly 16, at least 16% of the medical profession is addicted to opium by the turn of the century. What is the doctor responsibility in this? <clears throat> it's not just a current day question and it goes back to a very interesting uh, aspect of opium usage. Doctors took these medicines, these rough medicines, and they ground them in the mortar and pestle and they turn them into powder. And how are they gonna deal with this when they're on their wagon or and they're out on horseback with their saddlebags? They put it in paper folds, little colored paper folds, and they would put the powder in there and they would go out and distribute that as part of uh, prescriptions. In 1811, Nathan Smith, this is a, what I call a smoking gun, Nathan Smith, the founder of the Dartmouth uh, Medical School, is giving a lecture. One of his students takes notes from Smith describing how to, dis to, uh, to uh, administer these powders. And they did it by putting it into alcohol. And, whoops. In this case, the lecture had to do with how to deal with Peruvian bark. This is something that is still used today. It's used to treat malaria. And he talks about that it, uh, he never prescribes bitters or spirits for the stomach complaints. It always increases the affection. He's aware at this point that giving these medicines mixed in with alcohol is causing a problem with the people. And here's the, uh, here's the smoking gun. Dram drinking is often a consequence of taking medicine in spirits. Dramming was when you woke up in the morning, you would take your opium mixed in alcohol. When you got up, you take it mid-morning, you take it at lunch, you take it in the middle of the afternoon, you take it in the evening, you take it before you go to bed. And sooner or later, you're gonna get an addiction, not just to, uh, to alcohol, but to opium. It's dramming, dram drinking is what it was called. And this is going on until 1832, a doctor's giving an address to uh, the Dartmouth Temper Temperance Society. And he says, many a victim of intemperance might date the origin of his ruinous vice from a prescription by his physician. I think th this is big because when we get to the opium problem at the end of the century, you'll see why. What about this medical profession that's going on here in Vermont? This was an interesting thing to look at. It was split down the middle. There were the trained ones called the rationalists, and they said to go ahead and use opium, but then within their own ranks they had problems. Uh, was it a stimulant or was it a sedative? Because it rendered both effects. When do you use it? How do you use it? Do you put it into alcohol and have them ingest it? Or if they've got an injury, do you put it on a plaster and wrap it on their leg or their arm? Because opium will come from the outside in, not just in ingesting. Opposing the rationalists, the trained doctors, are the empiricists. The empiricists have no formal training. They're the botanical doctors, the Thompsonians, the steamers. These are the people um, that end up uh, causing great problems for uh, the trained doctors. And you see this for a lot of the um, 19th century. They believe in natural remedies. They do not believe in opium. And every time a doctor kills somebody with the opium, uh, they start to uh, dump on them uh, about their they're killing ways. So we have this conflicts going on within the medical profession. Professionalism, attaining professionalism becomes very difficult. These are doctors who are not just dealing with people, they're treating animals too. So they'll call into the farm and they'll treat your horse or cow and then uh, treat your, your baby. So they start to create county medical societies. The first one in 1784, the first medical society of Vermont, uh, doctors from uh, Rutland Bennington. In 1814, the Vermont Medical Society. Joseph Gallup uh, is a very important man during this uh, first half of the century. He writes sketches or ep of epidemic diseases in the state of Vermont up until 1815. There are a lot of episodes of diseases, and uh, particularly fevers, and he talks about the use of opium in there. We see other medical schools, 1818 uh, Castleton Medical School, UVM gets its in 1822. 
1835, Woodstock uh, creates its uh, medical school. The issue of licensing, the extent to which the legislature should control the uh, medical profession, and when we get to it, the pharmaceutical profession, is an issue. And the doctors look to the legislature. In 1820, they pass a law that uh, requires doctors to uh, have training and to, to pass a test and be monitored in 1820. And, but in the next decade, the community gets very upset with these elites having this profession set aside for them. It was in a monopoly, they said. They did not want the doctors to have it. So in 1833, the legislature rescinds the licensing law, and we have no licensing of doctors until 1878. So we have a number of decades where not only drugs aren't being regulated, but docs aren't being regulated either. So it's a free-for-all, and the quackery sets in, the untrained doctors. Opium becomes very uh, much more popular. In 1822, Dom Thomas de Quincey, an Englishman, uh, writes his famous Confessions of an English Opium Eater, and he talks about, and he uses mainly laudanum, but he talks about all of his bacchanals, and it gets published, and uh, it comes to America, and it gets distributed. So people are very aware of uh, of opium. In 1833, Brattleboro paper calls opium a very common and agreeable stimulus. People know it's there. This is another wonderful document uh, from the Rounder Special Collections. It's the um, Dartmouth Medical School Temperance Society. And what these young men are doing, you see their, their names here. And if you go switch up, flip the pages, you'll see there are a number of Vermonters that are attending Dartmouth at the time. They say, we, the undersigned, pledge ourselves to abstain from the use of intoxicating drinks, tobacco, and opium, except when prescribed. But here's the killer. And we further promise not to offer them to others unless in similar cases and to use our endeavors to influence those around us to act likewise. They're distributing it to their friends. They're getting it from these medical students. And you see the accounts of the, of the students that are, are using the drugs in the name of of education and learning. The doctor disputes continue. 1845, Gallup, you saw his picture. He's writing to another doctor about these clashing of opinions that are going on. And he says, it is notorious that the most ignorant gossip will undertake to decide for, for them, referring to the public because of the disputes that are going on. Yes. The public, when it's not getting uh, access to doctors, is self-medicating, and it's doing it big time. In 1827, uh, Bennington paper talks about uh, one way in which people come sick is by doctoring themselves when well, when well. and yet so, some will be continually dosing themselves with drugs. It's, they recognize that the people are, are consuming this. In 1839, uh, Medicine Chest for Ships and Families, published in Portsmouth, this is just representative of the kind of instructions uh, that's being given to the average Joe on the street. You can pick up this book, and it recommends uh, 45 drug preparations be listed or be held on medicine chests in ships. And if you've got a family on the frontier, you ought to have all these drugs, these 45 drugs. And they list laudanum here, and they list paragoric, which both of them are opium-based. Uh, and they talk about in laudanum, observe to be very careful in its use or too large a dose might be attended with fatal consequences. So people are experimenting with the medicines. Uh, these nos what are called um, patent medicines, they're also called nostrums, they're also called quack medicines. Any farmer can make them in his backyard. They take a vegetable and they grind it up and they make a vegetable compound. Uh, and they, in order to get repeated customers, you gotta put something in it that's gonna get them to come back. You gotta render some kind, of a, some kind of relief to why it is they're taking your product and then you want them to come back. So you mix in a little opium or a little morphine. And so this is another way that it's becoming used by the, um, by the public. This is, a, uh, this is a very interesting uh, and I, um, address by Dr. Jonathan Allen, Allen out of Addison County, and he's talking to the uh, Temperance Society, October 20, 1829. 
And this is, uh, this is another one of those smoking guns. And he's talking about temperance and alcohol and how it is that people get started with alcohol. And they're doing it by adding flavoring agents to make it palatable. But there's more to it than that. And he says, beginning uh, right in this area, it is a subject of notoriety that these additions are necessary to render these liquors agreeable to people who have not, by constant use, <coughs> habituated themselves to their stimulus. Most children will reject these inebriating potions unless the burning stimulus of the spirit is concealed by the inviting influence of sugar. The same requisites are essential uh, to induce a child to take opium, tobacco, and most other medicines. And then here's the killer line. Like opium or tobacco, too, ardent spirits become desirable as articles of living and even seem to constitute one of the necessaries of life. So you might be innocently thinking you're taking medicine and helping your kid and pumping sugar to him and his opium. You're also creating this addiction. And you see Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup to deal with the children's, children's teething or when to put the little darlings to bed at night. You give them a little soothing syrup, a little opium, and knock them out. And, and the literature says sometimes you're killing them too. Children uh, are learning very much about uh, opium and laudanum. In fact, when they go to school, here you see the 1859 uh, Vermont Speller. And in there, their children are being taught how to spell laudanum, to know that it's a noun, and to know that it's a tincture of opium. So this is not just something that is uh, something that's on the side. It's very much a part of Vermont society, and the children are learning it early on. We also see not just the children, but with the adults, we see a, a, uh, something going on with the, between the male and female adults. There's a difference between the, the sexes. And in 1841, uh, Temperance Society address, one of the uh, uh, people make, giving the address, talks about gentlemen going to wine and the ladies to opium. The fact is that in the 19th century, a lot of the opium usage was done by uh, well-to-do women. And, this, and here's, here's uh, how we can explain this. In 1856, an address to uh, graduates at the Vermont Medical College, the doc doctor says, the attachment of a woman to her phys physician, I speak of woman because it is with her we have the most frequent dealing in the sick room. Her attachment to her physician is one of the strongest she knows. The drugs he administers have a magical influence. The advice he gives is more palatable. Most of those who consult us come to pour out their private griefs, our known acquaintance with the woes of life, suggest us as the most easy to confide, confide in when they are in trouble. The women are not talking to their husbands about their problems, they're talking to their doctors, and the doctors are treating them uh, with opium. And that goes on through, uh, through the end of the century. Doctors are acting as these confidants. Um, another uh, a, a, a physician makes the, uh, makes the admission that the uh, that they're keeping these confidences. And he says that the physician is a mournful witness of too many such cases, but they must lie deep in his own bosom. The doctors are keeping this information to themselves. Quantification on this is difficult to come up with. It's also the same problem with the uh, temperance movement. There is no central registry until 1857 to record how people are uh, dying in Vermont. And even then, the doctors are protesting their participation. So we know that people are using it. The newspapers are telling us people are using opium out of curiosity. We know that accidental overdoses are occurring. We know that suicides are taking place. And the doctors are covering up calling them heart problems. Physician journals uh, are also very interesting. Dr. William Russell from Middlebury treats Mr. Amos Nichols here on the side. You can't see it from where you're sitting, but each one of these lines is an opium distribution to Mr. Nichols. Well over 100 as you go through the book. This man is clearly an addict, and this is dated 1844, right in there. That's just representative. We have an issue with regard to doctors and druggists. Uh, the doctors would get their drugs, as I mentioned, and, and grind them into compounds. 
I take them around the country in these uh, cases. This is from the Woodstock Historical Society from the mid-1800s. And inside these cases, you would see that they would have laudanum and paragoric. And the druggists would be in competition with them. This is the beginning of the drug, uh, uh, the druggist pharmacy uh, profession coming uh, to fruition. The druggists, people that are not uh, willing to pay a doctor or don't want to wait for one to show up at the farm, will speak to the to uh, the druggist at a general store, who will diagnose for you, he'll prescribe for you. And in fact, here's a ledger from a uh, pharmacy. And just on these couple of pages, to give you an idea of what this pharmacy was dealing with, <clears throat> Mrs. Marsh's cough drops with morphine in them, Tully's powder with morphine, Tully's opium and camphor mass, balm for itching pets with morphine, Mrs. Edson's cough mixture with morphine. There are recipes in here for uh, destroying the odor of smelling feet, cough powder for horses, and to show you just how eclectic these places were, how to make varnish so you could put it on your carriage. So, this, <laughs> so this, these pharmacists were jacks of all trades. We also know at the time uh, Wells Richardson uh, was one of the uh, uh, large drug companies up in Burlington comes uh, into existence and we see the development of uh, large amounts of uh, patent medicines coming out of places like that. And they have these cozy relationships with druggists and we know that doctors are getting kickbacks from dentists. They write prescriptions in code so that favored uh, druggists will be able to understand the prescription and then they will do a little kickback to the doctor. In 1852, prohibition comes along and then for the next half century, opium imports increase three times faster than the population growth uh, in the country. And now we start to see uh, people starting to take notice. In 1866, Vermont Medical Society uh, Vice President uh, Henry Jackson, Dr. Henry Jackson, uh, gives the first siren call here. Keep in mind, this goes on for the next uh, 50 years before we see legislation. So, but in 1866, right after the Civil War, he starts reporting to the society there are lots of people buying huge amounts of these patent medicines. And he cites an instance of one family who in the course of the prior 20 years used 3,000 bottles of these patent medicines. They were destitute, they lacked food, they couldn't put clothing on their children. Uh, and then at the same time, he derides the druggists for their prescribing, taking away what the doctors should be doing. He derides them for that and also for engaging in the kickbacks. This is in 1866. Also at the time, the ingenious Vermonters are doing things like growing opium here in Vermont on a commercial scale and Welcome Wilson creates this so-called American opium. It was also called Vermont opium. He's up in the Moncton area. Ends up being a big scam, and he, he does get some, some opium from local gardens, but what I suspect happened was he was mixing in some of this good Turkish or East Indian opium in order to kick up the potency. He ends up getting found out, and then he takes off. In the 1870s, uh, 1871, Massachusetts has got a drug problem. It puts... Uh, some investigators on it. Now what do they find? That the overflow of opium from Vermont, New Hampshire, and Connecticut is finding its way into Massachusetts. They had assumed that the stuff that they were growing up in, in these states was being used locally, but it looks like the overflow is going on into Massachusetts and causing an opium addiction problem down there. 1870, Dr. C.P. Frost uh, issues, opium, its uses and abuses. Politicians can't, can't say that they haven't been warned for the next 40 years. The doctors are screaming this. And Frost says that we can satisfy by a very limited investigation that the amount of opium prescribed by medical practitioners, large as it is, constitutes but a small proportion of the amount consumed in our state. It is generally used without the knowledge of many persons outside the family of the user unless it becomes large and people notice it. We know there are those who will deprive themselves and their families of all but the absolute necessaries of life. And he gives a great disclosure. Most of them take it in the form of opium or of morphine and they're taking it by mouth. So we know that a lot of people are doing it in 1870. In 1871, the Vermont Pharmaceutical Association creates comes into fruition, 
creates this code of ethics. And because nobody's uh, issuing any laws about this, they take it upon themselves. And in their code, they say, we hold that when there is good reason to believe that the pur pur purchaser is habitually using opiates or stimulants to excess, every druggist or apothecary should discourage the practice. So if you see someone coming in, they look a little um, addicted, uh, they should be kind of pulling them aside and discourage them. But what's going on with, the pro with prohibition and the alcohol situation? All you have to do is look at the uh, jail commitments in 1870 to see the ton of people here, intoxication. Everybody's uh, going into jail for intoxication. It's also interesting that they list the, uh, the nativity of the people that are involved in it. And sure, you see Americans and you see the French, Canadians, but there are an awful lot of Irish, too. <laughs> In 1882, the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, finally gets into the fray. People are, if they're not going to listen to the doctors, maybe the legislator will listen to a woman. And at that time, there was already laws in place that the students in Vermont schools had to be taught about hygiene. But the, the uh, temperance women said, let's do something about stimulants and narcotics. So Vermont becomes the first state to put a requirement in the uh, curriculum for students that they receive training on the effects and stimulants of narcotics upon the human system. Vermont's the first. Quickly afterwards, a number of other states fall into line and do the same thing. What's interesting in looking at the women's uh, temperance movement, as time goes on, they create these subcommittees amongst themselves, and they create one to deal with narcotics. In 1884, uh, bless the women, they put on a, a, uh, a contest, $50 in prizes for the best essays uh, in Burlington, uh, essays on the evil effects of stimulants and narcotics to be awarded to pupils of the high and grammar schools of the city. So the students uh, know full well what's going on. And then here's a, I love this title. In 1890, Dr. Shipman from Virginia writes, of, writes a paper called The Promiscuous Use of Opium in Vermont. This is 1890, and he calls it a crying evil of the day. We consume as much, if not more, opium and morphine than the same number of people in the US. I've seen five people enter a drugstore in Virginia and purchase it uh, within less two hours, within less than two hours, and no questions asked. And he's saying to other doctors, it seems to me it's our duty as guardians of the public health, as members of the society, to do in our power what we can to influence the passions of the law to mitigate this evil. It's still going to go on for another 25 years. But look at this. This is incredible. At the same time the doctors are making these calls and alerting everybody about the problems, Frank Plumley, the United States Attorney for Vermont, who's a rabid prohibitionist dealing with alcohol, what's he got to say? Take the state as a body. Every year shows improvement both in the vigor of enforcement of the prohibition law, remember 22 pages of the law, 111 sections, and the decreased intemperance and resulting crime. Is there a disconnect going on here or what? You've got the doctors that are screaming for help and you've got the United States Attorney saying, all is good. We are enforcing prohibition, what more do you want us to do? So now by 18, early 1890s, we're starting to, uh, there we go. The Keeley Institute opens up in Montpelier, and it's addressing drunkenness, the opium habit, neurasthenia, and the tobacco habit. Neurasthenia, if I'm pronouncing it right, is the response to all the modern technology that's going on. People are getting all agitated and upset, and the Keeley Institute is, comes into place uh, to deal with that. 1889, Dr. Uh, J.H. Woodard here at the University of Vermont Medical School issues uh, a final exam to his students in Materia Medica. Materia Medica is the use of, uh, of the, uh, the raw drugs, uh, how you imply them in certain circumstances, uh, whether it be um, coming from plants or minerals or what have you. It's just a course that medical students were required to take. And look at number eight of the exam. Give the symptoms and treatment of acute poisoning by opium. The medical profession is seeing overdoses and seeing people coming in that need uh, to be treated for these ODs. <clears throat> so the doctors know about that, but there's a frustration here, at least with Dr. Woodward. In 1895, the Burlington Clinical Society 
um, is established. And uh, Woodward makes an interesting admission here. Dr. Woodward says one of the greatest difficulties he had in teaching medical students was to impress on them the importance of knowing the physiological allure of drugs. So we're trying to train these doctors, not just about addiction, but how people, uh, the effect that it's having on them, this allure to it. So it's an uphill battle. We also have a distinct problem going on right at the same time because in, in, according to one survey in 1890, there were at least 86 unlicensed doctors in Vermont. There were definitely more than that. And we had uh, at least, uh, we had four diploma mills turning out medical uh, students in uh, Bennington, Rutland, Newbury, and Newfane. 1896, now we're getting to the heart of the matter as we go along. A uh, Dr. Cummings, uh, I believe he's from Derby, gives an address to the VMS on opium misuses and abuses. Uh, they're running out of titles for their talk, so they end up using the same, same one. But nothing can top the promiscuous use of opium in Vermont. That one's great. But what he says here is out of every 10 cases of addiction, I believe a doctor's responsible for nine of them for getting people hooked on it. And remember um, Nathan Smith back in 1811 prescribing, uh, taking, taking the fall for doctors prescribing uh, uh, alcohol with drugs mixed in them. And so it started then and it's continuing on here into 1896. And he is ripped. Dr. Cummings is really angry. I can hardly find the words strong enough with which to condemn the careless, nay criminal, prescribing of opium in chronic cases. These doctors are just livid uh, within the profession. Finally, doctor, uh, in 1900, <clears throat> at the request of the VMS, Dr. Ashbell Grinnell, a respected uh, uh, professor here at UVM and a dean of the medical school, writes, the use and abuse of drugs in Vermont, and this is the bombshell. What's interesting thing here in the opening uh, paragraph, he makes an apology here. Um, there, okay. Uh, I, I want to give off you an apology for offering any remarks upon a subject which is so hackneyed and so threadbare as the use of narcotics and stimulants in the state of Vermont. Within the medical profession, they have beat this horse to death. And so he's apologizing for talking about what he's going to be uh, disclosing. And what, what Grinnell did at the, on the behalf of the VMS, and he does one of the only studies in the country in this manner. A lot of the studies that are being conducted uh, are based anecdotally uh, on what's happening in communities. But what he does is he sends out a questionnaire to all of the state's druggists, doctors, manufacturers, wholesalers, uh, distributors and wherever else people have access to it. And he makes a request and he says, I'm going to keep your uh, information anonymous. I'm not going to give your name up, but I want to know what it is, the amount of drugs that you're selling in a month's time. A lot of them are refusing to bite and they're not going to cooperate. There's nothing that says they have to and they're not going to. But a number of them do and they write back. He's asking for the amount of monthly sales and they write back to him with these quantities. And he looks at them and he shakes his head. This can't be right. And he writes back to these people and he said, I want monthly sales. You, looks like you gave me yearly sales. And they write back to him and said, no, that's how much we sell in a month. And so Grinnell is just stunned by these disclosures. And what he does is he makes conservative, a conservative estimate relying only on 116 drugstores and he excludes uh, everything else. And in 1901, he got so much mileage out of the study, he ends up writing three papers on it. This happens to be the second one. And in this, he, uh, in 1901, he gives the, a breakdown here of all of the drugs that went into his calculations that we're gonna talk about here in a minute. And he lists all the drugs across the top, and he lists all the quantities down here. And you can't see it from where you are. But he talks that these quantities, this is a month sale, a population of 343,000, in case you're wondering. 47 pounds of opium, 19 pounds of morphine, 25 pounds of Dover's pills, 32 gallons each of laudanum and paragoric. And he notes that in one store, 
It's not even on the map. It's in a place that is not even on the map. In this one store, in a month, it sold three and a half pounds of opium, six ounces of morphine, five pints of paragoric, and five pints of laudanum. This turns out to be just an awful lot of drugs. And he writes his paper, and he says, I have been so astonished, so amazed at the result of my investigation. And this is the bottom line. In the drugstores in Vermont, these 116 stores, they sell 3 million, 300 doses, 300,000 doses of opium in a month, which gives one and a half doses of opium to every man and woman in the state of Vermont every day of the year. One month's sale gives you one and a half doses for a year. That is a lot of drugs. And he says, because of the uh, people that were not cooperating with him, he says, and that statement which I have made can be justly multiplied by five and then be below the actual consumption. So one month, one and a half doses a day for each adult uh, uh, man and woman uh, will last for a year. He does another calculation in another uh, writing. He does it on a per capita basis, which would include the uh, population count for children also. Whereas the rest of the country is using 52 uh, grains in a year, by the calculations uh, I come up with, it's over 2,000 a year that he assigns to uh, the people here in Vermont. Who's using this? Unfortunately, there's a lot of secrecy going on, and people are not disclosing their own uses, and doctors are not disclosing it. One doctor in 1900 writes, of country villages and farmhouses here in Vermont, they seem to furnish the greater number of users. And why this is so, let anyone tell. The doctors can't even tell where, where all of it's gone. An outside study that took a look at Grinnell's uh, numbers, uh, a person from New York at the time looked at it, and he said, uh, shook his head and said, there's much more uh, addiction, there's much more use of this, these drugs going on in Vermont than could conceivably assign to uh, medical uses. So it's a silent habit, like I said, some 16% of the doctors nationally uh, are addicted uh, themselves. We also know that addicts were coming from outside of Vermont, coming from states like Massachusetts and New York that had vigorous uh, laws dealing with this because Vermont had no laws. We know in 1911, <clears throat> Maine was seeing recreational users of drug come up. They, Maine had a problem. People were coming from Boston and New York and coming up to Maine uh, to take in the sites and use, use their opium. We also know that in the lumber camps in Maine, they were using cocaine at this time. But Grinnell goes on and he uh, talks to the doctors about the results of his, uh, his findings here. There isn't a day in your life when you don't come into contact with patients who suffer from the use or abuse of drugs, and he takes it on, he assumes responsibility here, we must shoulder the responsibility for having prescribed, recommended, or directed the use of these things which resulted, does result, and always will result in misery and horror. And then he goes on to blame the legislature. What does it take to get you people to open up your eyes and take your eyes off of uh, this alcohol problem and uh, can't you see what kind of a problem we've got here with opium? It becomes a campaign issue in 1902 when Percival Clement, uh, who's a gubernatorial candidate, uh, goes on to say there's more morphine, chloral opium, and kindred drugs consumed in our state per capita than in any other state in the union. And I can only surmise that he took that straight from Grinnell's study here. And this is the year when finally prohibition uh, uh, goes out until national prohibition goes in in uh, 1920 with the 18th Amendment. Nationally, we're starting to get some movement. In 1905, Congress uh, restricts uh, the imp uh, importation of opium. In 1906, to deal with these patent medicines, with these hidden drugs in them, they passed the Pure Food and Drug Act. People have to start disclosing what's inside there. A lot of these patent medicine companies go out of business or they're being prosecuted for uh, false labeling. In 1910, interestingly, Vermont Congressman David Foster introduces the first national legislation to deal with, uh, with drugs, a gentleman from Vermont, and he does it via taxation. Unfortunately, he dies 
uh, shortly after, but it's picked up by a uh, New York representative. In 1911, if you look at the congressional testimony that's looking at the drug problem in the U.S., Vermont is cited in there. Not a, it's not just the problems in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, and Baltimore, but somebody gets up and gives testimony about, have you seen what's happening up in Vermont? And if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. 1914, finally, the National Congress, uh, the Congress passes the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act. It's our first drug law. The following year, Vermont begins to fall into line. Other states have already done it, but finally, in 1915, Vermont introduces or passes an act to regulate the sale of opium, morphine, and other narcotic drugs. And I believe it's a, a misdemeanor. It says that the fine is uh, 50 to $1,000 and jail of no more than a year, which would, I believe, make that a misdemeanor. And so in this year, 1915, if you go back and look at what the pharmacists are doing, I got this from a great retired pharmacist who's got all kinds of stuff uh, down in Rutland, but he's got these old ledgers. And in 1915, you see these in red? These are prescriptions with opium and morphine in them. And so the pharmacists are starting to keep records of the customers coming in, and you can see what it is, the prescription is, but if it's a dangerous drug like that, they're starting to highlight them in red. So what are the lessons that come out of this? I know people are going to want to uh, make connections to the current issues. I'm a little resistant to do that. Uh, there are much more knowledgeable people with stronger minds than mine that uh, can talk to you about the, the current day issues. So I'll make kind of some bland comparisons between then and now. People will get their stimulants, no question. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's opium, what have you, people will get their stimulants, and it doesn't matter what kind of laws you put in the way. Technology is a blessing and a curse. Uh, we see the increased potency of drugs taking place. The drugs that we have today are much more potent than they were 20 years ago. They're nothing compared to what we're going to be seeing in 20 years in the future. Prohibition was essentially a, a paper tiger here in Vermont. Uh, it dissuaded the people that were the law-abiding, that would not go and break the law. But if you wanted alcohol, you could get alcohol. You see account after account of that going on. So I submit to you at this point, we're at a maintenance level as opposed to a prohibitive level. How are we going to maintain our control of it, because if you're paying attention uh, to the news just a couple of days ago in Manchester, a bombshell went off when uh, some 80 pounds of heroin landed uh, coming from down south. Uh, no matter what we do, it's, uh, the international connection is just uh, off the charts. And then the other thing that we need to keep in mind as we deal with our current problems, uh, the accountability uh, within that distribution chain. What are the legitimate uses for pain management versus those that are using it recreate? I love that word, recreational drugs. <laughs> and how aggressive, yeah, I think a legitimate question that we could ask is how aggressive are, and are, are our enforcement measures you see these uh, uh, out-of-state uh, drug dealers that are being picking, picked up with all too uh, f distressing frequency here in Vermont. Uh, but uh, I submit to you that if you look at the chain going from manufacturer down to consumer, which would include druggists and doctors and nurses and caregivers and what have you, if you examine uh, as many levels as you could and put as much resources into looking at that as you are, into the uh, people coming up from out of the state to deal with the drugs, you would see that there was uh, probably untapped places in, uh, and um, for enforcement and that there are a, lot, a number of abuses going on there. And I'll close with this. This comes, uh, I won't close with that, but if you paid attention to the, to the literature uh, recently, this is the young lady who's pushing syrup of taro to Montpelier that had heroin in it. But this is, uh, as of two months ago, the Vermont uh, Department of Health makes this statement. According to data from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, overall drug-related fatalities in Vermont have not changed greatly over the past five years. Starting in 2013, heroin and 
fentanyl-related fatalities have risen sharply and deaths involving prescription opioids, opioids have begun to decrease. It is notable that suicide comprises approximately one-fifth of drug-related fatalities in Vermont between 2004 and 2014. 20% is attributable to, uh, to suicides. And that, uh, I think, no, we can't put a number on it, but certainly it is something that was going on in the 19th century that we're talking about, that opium use was not just for the addicts, but for those that were uh, taking the final leap. Thank you. Sure. Questions? Um, yes, sir. Uh, given the slide that you have up there, is, isn't it the case that now uh, people start and become addicted on prescription drugs, then they can no longer afford to buy those, so then they change to heroin, so that, and, and then heroin is what does them in in the end? I think there are... I'm not the person to talk to about the current day problem. I mean, if you want to talk about the 19th century, um, but I think you're probably right. I mean, if people need the stimulant and want to get it, it is available, whether uh, abusing prescriptions, taking it from a relative that's got prescriptions, um, or buying it on the street. It is just way too available. Does, oh. Let me give you, you I have a lot of <laughs> You also seem very attentive. So this is fascinating. I'm John Brooke, I'm a physician, and I do addiction medicine work. Okay, excellent. So, but I'm not here to answer any questions. <laughs> so this is an area that I've always been really fascinated by as a historical perspective. Can you go into a little bit more depth around what was happening around 1900 to 1915 that created the Harrison Act? Because that was a watershed moment in our country in terms of suddenly making it a criminal offense to be in possession of heroin or morphine if you were prescribed. And do, do you get a sense of the, because the, the, the senator from Vermont had a certain mission in mind when he was proposing that. Was that really based on a temperance movement? Or was there another aspect of controlling the supply for taxation? That's the part I was never really clear on. I don't know if you were able to get that wrong. Is that the way it forms even today how we respond to the use of opiates in our society, whether it's a criminal activity or whether it's one that we should tax and allow people to use? There are answers there, and I can give you, I can give you citations of books that will answer that for you. Keep in mind, heroin didn't show up until 1898. I'm sure you know that uh, from the Bayer company in uh, Germany. So what we say is a phasing, uh, phasing out of opium and morphine and people are switching over to heroin. And you know, the per, uh, uh, there, there are just so many different factors. It depends on your socioeconomic uh, level, whether you live in a city, whether you live in the country, whether you're an, an opium smoker, whether you inject, whether you snort. I mean, there are all kinds of different parameters that go into this. I, don't, I can't give you an answer as to why in 1915 we finally had the Harrison Act, except that I think the pressure just became so immense. And also there was the Hague uh, Opium uh, Convention happening right about that time, just immediately before the Harrison Act. Uh, I think things were just coming to a head. And nobody was comfortable doing it, anything until we got the international part taken care of. I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure I haven't answered your question, but I can, you can give me your email address. I can give you a couple, references to a couple of great books that I'm sure will answer that. In the early years when opium was so readily available, was it absolutely cheap compared to oh, yeah. the time of dirt cheap? Yeah, it was, it was pennies. Yeah, it was. I cite the, uh, the numbers. Uh, Russell in Middlebury, where we saw the uh, opium. I mean, it was like 34 cents or something for, I don't know, an ounce of opium. Oh, yeah, I mean, you could, this was not prohibitive. People could get it easily. Yes, sir. Hi, Gary. Uh, in the 20th century, 
along with the, the extent of drug abuse, there was a tremendous explosion of property and violent crime. Were there those concomitants in the 19th century to the abuse of opium and morphine? No, you, you don't see that. I mean, a lot of, I mentioned a lot of the opium abuse was to the higher class women getting it, getting started by their doctors. Uh, you don't see a lot of the violence. I mean, there, it wasn't a crime that we had no law in existence to make it a crime. It only becomes a crime after 1915 when... So it was a major public health problem Correct. in the 19th century. Right. But, I, but, but I, it became a criminal problem in the 20th century. You've got to have a law to have a criminal. So, and that didn't happen until 1915. about give, uh, feeding this uh, Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup and these other opium-based concoctions to children was that you would, might feed them too much and a mother might be in distress as to what the effect is having on the child. So they give them other drugs to think that they're going to counter the effects of the opium. So all you're doing is just compounding the problem. And you, I mean, it, it was not, un, not unusual uh, to kill your child. But the doctors will cover that up for you. I mean, the doctors, I mean, there was nothing that required them to report it until 1857, anyway. That was very accessible, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And the doctors didn't want to report it because their big beef was who's going to pay us for taking the time to go to the county or to the town clerk to record it? So the doctors were not up for uh, participating in, the, uh, in this, keeping these records of the mortality rates. Can you speculate as to why Vermont might have had more of a problem than other states in the, in the 19th century? Well, I mean, I mean, it's a good question, and we're surmising here. Grinnell was upset that the legislature didn't step in earlier and because it was so focused on prohibition. And so there was nothing that said that people could not take it. We had the untrained doctors, the unlicensed doctors. We had the free availability of these drugs. There was nothing to say that they couldn't use them. But other states did have laws. And so Vermont was just a little late um, coming up with them. So I think that there are a number of factors that all played together. I don't think you can say it was any one thing. fortune in Vermont and one of the largest in the country was the Billings family who based their fortune on the opium trade. Well, I don't know if I... <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I did not know that. Okay. <laughs> And there were certainly, I mean, uh, Wells Richardson was a very uh, affluent company up in Burlington. They had a huge advertising budget. And plus, uh, if you follow the chain, if the doctors are getting kickbacks from the druggists, we know that there were special cozy relationships between the druggists and the manufacturer also going on. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was some quid pro quo going on there. You buy our drugs, you will get a, a rebate, a favorable rebate, yeah. So I saw a lot of sources and a lot of comments from sort of the establishment from doctors and, and the law 
law and things like that. Did you come across any sources from individual addicts or families dealing with addicts that sort of told the, the human side of this, or is it truly that hidden? I didn't see it in Vermont, but if you read some of the out-of-state literature, you will see that the addicts in other states are coming forward and talking about their problems. But I, I looked like cr for as much as I could to try and find some primary source that put those kinds of words in a, into a Vermonter's mouth, and I couldn't find them. But the doctors were speaking for them, and the sales of all of these um, drugs were also speaking for them. So you commented earlier that um, uh, addicts will always get their substances. Um, but it also sounds like you attribute the eventual decrease in uh, opium and heroin use to criminalization. Would that be fair to say? And if it is, um, how do you think that could translate to our current problem? I mean, that's a great question. I don't, I, I don't think it decreased even though you criminalized it. If you look into uh, what was going on during Prohibition, during the Jazz Age, if you will, uh, there were some interruptions in the First and Second World War, but you, there was uh, a lot of opium, uh, I'm sorry, um, heroin. Heroin that was being used during this time and it has just escalated all along. I don't think the, uh, by making it a crime has necessarily, I mean, Making it a crime will stop the honorable people, that, the law-abiding people, from engaging in it. But that's by no means everybody. Time for one more question. Here it is. If so many people were addicted and suddenly, and law-abiding citizens were addicted, obviously, um, and all of a sudden the supply is cut off, did you find what happened to those people who were addicts? Well, I mean, the addiction didn't stop. I think it peaked nationally roughly in mid-1890s, uh, and then it begins to drop off with, the, with these uh, state and national laws. So it doesn't go to zero. It just decreases. It's still a simmering uh, problem. It never went away by any means. But it, it's been said that that period, 1895 to 1900, was probably the peak. At least that was the literature as it was, has been written in the last couple of years. If, if those, um, those studying the times took a close look at what was going on today, they might reassess uh, some of those findings. Gary, uh, it's my pleasure to thank you for starting the Samuel B. Hand lecture series in such a bang up great way, filling the hall, uh, sound research that hasn't been presented previously. It's a very nice start for this. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure to thank you, sir. Thank you. It's also a pleasure to thank the Vermont Historical Society and to remind you that the current issue of Vermont history is available here. It's being waved at the back, and it has Gary's article in it, uh, which I have read and enjoyed, both in draft and his published form. <laughs> and thank also the Center for Research on Vermont uh, for collaborating with the, State Histor with the Vermont Historical Society and Jeff Marshall and Special Collections. It's a powerful group together, really turned out an audience tonight, and we look forward, I do in particular, to your successor and keeping this series running. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.